The second half of the 20th century has been a great question. Ever since the invention of the atom bomb in 1945, mankind has had the ability to do irreparable damage to itself. This sword has hung over our heads ever since, with us continuing to live our lives with the knowledge that in half an hour, it could all be gone. We've been exceptionally lucky that the only nukes to be used in anger were in the Second World War. The human race has shown exceptional foresight and self-control when a gun's been put to its head. However, there was once a point where everything nearly did fall apart. In 1983, an error in the Soviet missile tracking system showed that the Americans were launching a nuclear attack against Russia. Soviet-American relations were simmering at the time, and so from a political perspective, it was not unreasonable. We were saved by Stanislav Petrov, a minor figure in the Soviet military, who decided not to forward information of the attacks to his superiors for the fear that it was a miscalculation and they'd act upon it. This hero saved billions of lives and got practically nothing for it afterwards, receiving no medals from the Soviet state or even a pension. Even though, by some metrics, he was the most important figure of the century, and possibly the total of history. However, what would have happened if that never occurred? How would history be different if Stanislav had decided to forward the information to his superiors, and they in turn decided to launch a nuclear strike against the United States? How would that have affected the rest of history? How about borders, demographics, culture, and wars? That is the question of this alternate history. Before we start, if a nuclear war broke out, it would be caused by a serious miscalculation on the part of the elite involved. We can prevent the sword of Damocles by falling on us by being as logical and clear-headed as possible. You can start improving your logic skills with Brilliant. They have courses in stuff like logic, scientific thinking, mathematical fundamentals, and introduction to neural networks. I took and liked their logic course, since an understanding of logic and cause is necessary to understanding the past and what it means. Brilliant helps you learn difficult mental processes in a fun game-like manner. It helps you develop critical thinking skills and improve attention to detail, and you can do it at any pace you like. All their courses are developed by experts and professionals from places like MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, or Google, so you know you're in good hands. Click the link in the description to get started today. The first 200 people to click the link get 20% off their annual subscription. Start learning today with Brilliant. In this timeline, the Soviet High Command decides to launch a nuclear strike against the United States. In retaliation, the United States launches its own nuclear attack against Russia. Both countries had very extensive ally networks, with effectively all of Europe alongside many nations in the Pacific Rim being nuked. China was also an American ally during this era, and the Russians would launch nukes at them for fear the Chinese would nuke them, which would in fact result in the Chinese nuking them. The countries that wouldn't get involved in all would generally be the weaker and poorer ones, with the most substantial ones being Brazil, India, and apartheid South Africa. The way our culture thinks about nuclear radiation is really bizarre. It really reminds me of the medieval traveler's tales, in which there may have been a kernel of truth originally, but that was so inflated upon that in the end, some bizarre mythology with no relation to the original truth develops. I'm just gonna warn you, this is outside of my speciality. Chemistry is one of my weakest subjects, and I'm going to get at least one thing wrong. However, I come from a proud line of preppers, and so I've studied the effects of nuclear war quite deeply. Radiation doesn't cause bizarre mutations, and when it does cause them, they tend to die out very quickly. You don't see stuff like the Hulk or the ghouls from Fallout, you get weird miscarriaged fetuses. Similarly, Fallout doesn't weirdly pollute an environment. Chernobyl is a gorgeous and thriving national park, with one of the most pristine forests in Europe. The main effect radiation has is a spike in cancer cases. Some say Chernobyl caused a couple thousand cancer deaths afterwards. 
Radiation isn't a horrifyingly weird or magical force. It's like to getting a sunburn what being pawed by a kitten is to getting mawed by a tiger. It does, however, cause a nuclear winter, which due to the aerosols from the nuclear attack settling into the atmosphere, results in a decline of sun reaching the Earth, effectively the opposite of global warming, which results in basically a several year winter across the northern hemisphere. Another terrible condition is that the nuclear war would weaken the ozone layer and further increase cancer cases. This would basically result in mass starvation across the world. We'd basically be forfeiting at least one year of harvest in the most fertile regions of the northern hemisphere. This would result in immense instability and death, of course. However, when all things are considered, humans would still survive. Humans are really tough beings when pushed. Having hiked the Appalachian Trail from personal experience, I've seen the shocking transformation of relatively soft city people turning into people who can handle shocking amounts of suffering and discomfort. On a historical basis, people have lived through some really bad shit. Whether the Younger Dryas, which was 11,000 years ago when a comet likely hit Canada, thus plunging the world into an ice age in a matter of decades, or the eruption of supervolcano Toba 71,000 years ago, which blocked out the sun, resulting in a global famine and ice age. When it comes to missing a year of harvest, this regularly happens in pre-modern eras, with in some eras of history, like the 17th century, becoming distressingly common. With a single year of no food, most people were able to scrounge by. By the second or third year, mass deaths started to take place. In the massive food exporting countries like the US or Canada, there would likely be enough surplus to help out a lot. There's this weird belief that a nuclear war would completely extinguish human life, for life in the northern hemisphere at least. I see little evidence for this. For the most part, it seems like a belief invented by anti-nuclear and anti-war advocates. The best projections I've seen for a nuclear war in the 1980s is a billion deaths and the immediate aftermath and more due to the nuclear winter. Considering the world's population was 4.6 billion, that's around a quarter conservatively, which is manageable. The fact that due to the nuclear arsenal's downsizing and the growing importance of missile defense systems, the number is now at 300 million makes me feel very good about the human race. For a comparison, some historians say that the 17th century's crisis killed a third of the world's population. You'll hear stuff like there were enough nukes to fully extinguish life on Earth, which is technically true. However, this is mainly since the Soviet Union and United States were having this bizarre dick measuring contest by which they were producing such astronomical numbers of nukes, since they wanted to have enough nukes in order to still destroy the enemy, even if the enemy nuked all their nukes before they could launch them. And then they had to neutralize those nukes in turn. It over time became a more emotional issue about a missile gap, even if the gap didn't really matter since both sides had far more nukes than they would ever use. In the nations nuked, power would immediately become much more decentralized. As the centralized governments would be incinerated, nations like the Soviet Union, China, Poland, France, and the United States would simply stop existing, with the local authorities becoming significantly more important than the non-existent centralized ones. In many countries, similarly to after the fall of Rome, many local governments would claim to be the representatives of the pre-existing pre-apocalypse ones, but in reality that would be impossible. We've run into the issue where you see in areas like Europe after the fall of Rome, where local power would be so important and the individual influence of leaders so important that predicting anything long term is borderline meaningless. In some areas, universities would be able to wield their student populations into cohesive military forces to seize power of the region. In some areas, the local military formations would be able to gain power. In some areas, it would be the ex-communist commissars, church organizations, the police, bowling leagues, etc. I have no idea what would occur in any individual area. In some, the local state governors would be talented and be able to hold power together effectively. In others, authority would collapse to the most basic level, with independent households or darts teams being the prime form of political organization. This sort of thing would end up being vitally important. If a state like Ohio could survive as a central organization while Indiana would collapse into warring clans, that would give Ohio an immense advantage in the decades to come. Peripheral areas would become more important. A geographically blessed region like the Rhinelands or the American Mid-Atlantic would suddenly become nuked, while more out-of-the-way areas like the American Rockies or Scandinavia would be in much better shape. 
China is sort of interesting in that by this point, it was by far the most rural of the powers involved, and thus would have a much higher percentage of its population survive. Similarly, smaller, more urbanized, and densely populated non-Russian Europe would be worse affected than either Russia or North America. Even in the countries that would see no nuclear strikes, there would be political instability. In Africa, where a significant part of the population would be subsistence farmers who would be susceptible to the change in climate and where central government is weak in the first place, you would see massive changes in borders and governmental collapses. Areas like Bolivia or Chad, where the peasantry are already living pretty close to subsistence, would likely collapse into chaos as centralized government would fall apart. India, although neutral as a massive culturally disparate and at the time quite inefficient confederacy, where much of the population already lives pretty close to the subsistence level, would likely still fragment and collapse even with the possibility of no bombs being dropped on it. Australia and New Zealand are both developed states that have some chance of survival. Both were of minimal strategic importance and at the bottom of the world, and thus would face minimal nuclear strikes and lesser effects of radiation and nuclear winter. With capable leadership, either state could have survived. Another state with some chance of survival is Brazil, which could turn out to be the most powerful nation on Earth. Brazil is a food exporter and without getting nuked would likely be able to buckle down and with some hungry times be able to hold together politically. Strangely enough, apartheid South Africa would likely be in a similar situation. The apartheid regime, which was always subconsciously preparing for the apocalypse, would be able to deal with the hungry times and politically repress the dissidents. As South Africa would become the only remaining power in Africa, as the continent would begin to collapse into division, would start to expand across the whole southern part of the continent. We shouldn't fall into the fallacy that just because these countries would be the most powerful and functioning states that they'd be pleasant or developed. These would be desperately unpleasant places, likely with rationing and on the knife's edge of always collapsing. Without the global economic revolution of the 1990s and 2000s, they would also be significantly poorer. Rio wouldn't be some hyper-developed paradise, it would be a dingy city with decaying buildings. The end of the world would have a profound cultural effect on the entire world. There would be two common reactions to the world-ending horror. The first would be a massive conservative reaction. People would turn to old religion as a way of coping with the horrors that had just happened to give assurance and stability in a chaotic world. People would try to pastiche the past in order to maybe regain part of its glory. The warlords of the new era would wear blue jeans as a luxury item and commission rockers to entertain their courts. The second reaction would basically be that scene in Mad Max or Fallout, in which due to the horrors of the world around them, would go off in some bizarre new uncharted direction. New religions and cults would spring up, holding some absolutely bizarre beliefs. The nuclear war would have traumatized an entire world and shattered their preconceptions about how the world should work, opening up a void. I'm just gonna say, the portrayals we get of what a post-nuclear world would look like, like Fallout or Mad Max, are woefully inaccurate. I understand they're dealing with a super depressing topic, and so an accurate take wouldn't sell anything. But seriously, do these people know how expensive black leather would be in a post-nuclear world? Similarly, in a world where gas is limited, people wouldn't be driving these giant gas guzzlers. A better view of a post-nuclear war's world's fashion would be the clothes you're currently wearing in terrible, overworn, stitched-up shape with whatever terrible knitwear people could figure out how to make. The new generation that would grow up after the nuclear war would be unbelievably tough. They'd be selected among the toughest or luckiest people who survived the previous nuclear war. They'd grow up in an unimaginably harsh world. Their value system would be miles away from our current world, likely more in line with the harshest worldviews of our ancestors, combined with some millennialism and distrust of the world around them. They would look back on the pre-nuclear war era with a combination of hatred and reverence. They would hate that the world itself imploded and destroyed itself. They would likely view it as the end point of a decadent society that had been stagnating since the First World War, and many would view the nuclear war as predestined. Similarly, they would still view the pre-war society as near divine, a model they would try and ultimately fail to regain. Demographic effects would be enormous. For example, in the United States, some mainly urban groups like the Jews, Italians, Asians, blacks outside the South, and a good number of Irish Catholics would just be wiped out. 
In Europe, groups like the Swedes or Scots would have much more comparable numbers to the Germans or English. Technology would immediately stagnate. Advanced technologies like nuclear fission would immediately lose applicability. People would stagnate in the initial few decades to a pre-industrial subsistence economy. However, as time would progress, different communities would be able to up their economies, with more returning to an industrial level. Interestingly enough, the internet would still exist. The internet was actually created by the military in case of a nuclear war so that scientists across America could continue to communicate. I see some nerds were reading Isaac Asimov's Foundation. This is super interesting, and it would be fascinating to see this become an important variable over time. An important breakthrough for the economy would be when the former cities would finally become untoxic enough to pass through. The cities themselves aren't that important, but most river systems have cities that would get nuked, and since the vast majority of trade, especially in a world starved of gasoline, is facilitated by river systems and with lots of strategic points in the river systems nuked, would strangle trade for decades. Development would be very patchy. With power so decentralized and trade so weak for a while, some relatively close areas would be able to get a decent standard of living, while others would still be doing subsistence farming, just due to often slight differences in quality of leadership and the soil quality having immense results. War would be omnipresent in this era. As resources would be scarce and political power would decentralize, it's almost certain. As political power would be weak for the most part in the beginning, these wars would start out being small-scale. However, as communities would be able to get their bearings together, they'd be able to exert more influence. The groups that could get their act together first would be the ones that would be able to secure oil supplies earliest and be able to figure out gun manufacturing first. They would have an immeasurable advantage over those who would be using odd weapons and have no mobility. Similarly, drill and military training confers unbelievable advantages that few people realize. This is how the Romans and British were able to continually win with numerically insane odds against opponents who often had similar technology. Under these circumstances, the ex-military states would have an immense advantage to those formed by bowling leagues or churches. You would start to see local power bases and nations form. As an example, let's say the governor of Kentucky in 1983. John Brown Jr. was an especially talented guy and was able to keep Kentucky together while Tennessee and Ohio fell into warlords and chaos. This would mean that Kentucky would be able to operate as a unified trade sector, which would let it get wealthier and develop faster, which would mean that it would be able to further develop mentally and be able to manufacture tanks and use its National Guard regiments to train a quality army, which in turn it could use to conquer its neighbors. Then let's say Ohio did fall into warlords, but realizing Kentucky's power and by being defeated at the Battle of Chillicothe realizes they need to ally together or be conquered, and so much of Ohio unifies to form a federation in which each town has a certain degree of power. Almost none of the people forming these new nations would be political philosophers. They would be practical people trying to work through complicated situations. Under these circumstances, you would start to see wide diversifications of models. Some nations would be slave states, some would be anarcho-capitalists, and others would be theocracies. Similarly to the fall of Rome, this would effectively be a reset of the political system. The chances that countries like the US, Australia, or Russia, that got as big as they are by defeating technologically inferior non-European tribes, would ever reform are pretty low. Identities like Primorian, Texan, or Albertan would become very distinct, becoming nearly like different European nations. For the more geographically concentrated nations in places like Europe or Japan, the chances are higher that the countries would be able to reform after a century or more. A really important shift would take place once the world and much of the prime farmlands would become unradiated enough for permanent healthy human life. In the immediate aftermath of the crisis, families would be tiny as the resources would be limited. However, as the environment would heal, humans would find themselves living in a really underpopulated world of mostly second growth virgin land around them. This would spark massive population growth and a second renaissance and cultural flowering. What a fall test, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Alternatively, check out Brilliant by clicking the link in the description, or checking me out in Patreon, where I've got my first few chapters of the history of the world. And if you want even more, check me out on Twitter. As always, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.